All right, what's up, guys? Today we're back with another episode featuring our uh, our esteemed guest Zach. Today we're going to be trying to teach Zach some Rust programming skills, and the project we're going to be working on, or projects if things go really well, are the Crawford programming projects on GitHub. So these are basically some chemistry projects that walk you through. They're intended to walk you through the basics of C++ programming. But it's pretty easy to port the instructions to other languages, so we're just going to be going through that as a good, a good excuse to write some code. So uh, with that, uh, I'm actually eating breakfast right now, so you're going to see me muting and uh, you know shoveling food in my mouth occasionally. But <laughs> other than that, we'll be we'll be working through this with Zach. Yeah, one. I think one of the good things about so one of the at least the philosophy that you have or that you've learned over the years about learning programming languages is that it's better to learn a language when you can have a project to apply it to because then you can you're like solving a problem that you have with this programming language and then you kind of learn the syntax as you go um and so doing these the crawford projects which are specifically for um I, I don't even know how to begin to explain it in a way that would make sense. I don't, because I don't want to get deep in the weeds about what it is that like the research that we do and the stuff like that. But essentially you're just taking something and you're trying to get them the, the, the best form of it, I guess is the best way to say that. I don't know. I really don't know how to. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I mean, all I would say is the, yeah, the Crawford, pro Zach's exactly right. One thing that held me up when I was learning programming is I would, read programming books and they teach you syntax. So I read some Python book, like even when I was a kid and I learned all the stuff like, Oh, this is a variable and this is a loop and this is another kind of loop and all that kind of stuff. But if you don't have any reason to actually apply that information, it doesn't really mean anything to you. So you really need something to work on that where you can apply the things that you're reading or the things that you're learning. And in this case, since we're chemists, uh, these Crawford programming projects are basically basically like word problems for programming based on chemistry. So uh, in this first one, we're basically doing a very simple geometry analysis of a molecule. So we're going to be computing a bunch of things like bond lengths and bond angles. So if you've taken geometry, you will be able to follow along, even if you're not doing a PhD in chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> now, when we move on yeah. to the second and third projects, that's when uh, some of the PhD classes might come in handy, but uh, for the first one especially, it should be pretty much pure programming with a little math. So it's a it's a good thing. So yeah, just I recommend yeah. these even if you're kind of loosely interested in chemistry, just as a good excuse to to write some code. Yeah, I yeah I guess that's a much better way of explaining it. I never know how in depth I need to go. With I this understand. Stuff yeah, because it's like you know, I mean, the chemistry that we do is it can be pretty top. Not, I don't want to say top level because I, I don't want to sound too high on a horse, you know, <laughs> yeah. but it's like, you know, we do a lot of really in, intense physical chemistry with this kind of stuff. And it doesn't seem, it seems like trivial for us because we've done it for so long because we just, we know, we know we, we give the, we give the program a geometry and we say, optimize this geometry and give us the lowest energy form of that structure. Yeah, but this, is not that, a, this isn't even an optimization. Like this is literally just gathering up the the bonds and angles and stuff yeah okay yeah, yeah. A geometry That's, optimization yeah. would be very complicated <laughs> yeah that yep. would be a big project yeah <laughs> one i guess just to mention one other thing i like about the crawford projects are that they're a little bit more in depth than an advent of code problem for example and they all build on each other sometimes advent of code works like that um <laughs> but but you can do yeah, but advent of code is hard yeah it, it gets hard really fast like this doesn't really get any harder going through the first three projects um so this is this is just a, a good place to start i think if you're learning language yeah yeah that's true that all right true. well let's okay, dive right. in project number one yeah what do i need to do in order to get set up with Ru like so we've already so in the previous videos um we got uh you know what tech but specifically for this one we got rust set up um so what is it that we need to do now because a new edition of, of rust just released so um what do i need to do 
in order to get myself set up and ready to just start writing in rust in that regard sure yeah so so first of all uh not to be too pedantic but rust actually has things that are called additions and oh. just for all the viewers out there a new edition did not come out <laughs> the the rust editions are like every three years i think so there's like the 2015 edition 2018 edition we're still on the okay. 2021 edition i guess until next year um but a new version did come out so if you yeah if you want to fire up a terminal we can see this so I think Rust 172 just came out, or 171. Okay. Um, you know, Zach, Zach and I are using nightly Rust anyway, so it doesn't really matter what the exact version is. But one thing I noticed in, in this version uh, is that there are some really nice documentation improvements. So let's go ahead and get the newest version. Well, actually, we can check your old version. So to do that, you can just do cargo dash dash version. <clears throat> okay, yeah, and you're on 173 nightly. Um, right. But let's we'll update anyway. Um, so you can do rust up. Uh, I think it's just update. Rust up update, huh? Yep. Hey, yo. Yeah, I think, so 170, I forget how the numbers work. I think 172 just came out. The beta channel should be called 173, and nightly is called 174. Some, something like that. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so this is just update everything. All right, perfect. <laughs> and now, uh, let's open the docs. So I actually had to Google this before because I just have a bookmark in my browser. Uh, but yeah, no, no, uh, do rust up doc. Rust up doc? Yeah, we'll like see that? what happens. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that was so cool. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, go down. Look at that. Go to the uh, the search box. Yeah, just hit search. Hopefully it'll pull us to the... Uh... There we go. Oh, it even looks Yo, better. Yo, that's cool. Yeah, okay, so try searching for something. Just type vec space okay yeah so this these are some of the new updates in the documentation so you'll see on the left it's showing you the type of thing so you can click on the standard vec module or the struct or the macro it used to not show that it used to also not use spaces as path separators so you would actually have to type colon colon to do this oh, search no. yeah so everybody out there go update your rust this is reason enough <laughs> Stop right. watching this video right now. <laughs> no, 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 no. Stay on the video. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, there's the docs. We could also pull up the Rust book. No, yeah, we, we might be okay without the Rust book, though. Rust book. <clears throat> All right. Hey, look at that. That's cool stuff. I guess, actually, do you want to real quick give people if you think it'll be useful do you want to give people a background on your your programming ability or have you read any of this book or anything like that um so i would say that my programming ability is equivalent to a kid with one of those little puzzles that's like putting the the different shape blocks into the holes and every time I've ever tried to pick up like a programming book and learn how to program any language, it doesn't matter what it was, I would put the wrong block in the wrong hole and then can just keep dreaming until like I just gave up because I was like, well, I'm never going to learn this. Like it just it, I, learning a programming language has always seemed like a very insurmountable task because it just seems like I like I don't know how to think like a programmer. I don't know. I don't have the, the skill set yet to think like a programmer or to use the tools that come in a programming language in order to solve problems. I will say, though, that a lot of that also comes from I, I just I don't I have never had an issue where I've ever had to re repeat a task so many times 
that it got to the point where I felt like I needed to write a little script or even a program to solve or to do that thing for me. So I didn't have to manually handle all of that. Um, so I've never really thought that I needed to learn how to program or learn a programming language. Now, of course, as I get further and further into my computational chemistry degree, it seems more and more, um, it makes more and more sense that I need to learn how to program in at least one programming language, if not multiple, that way I have an idea of different programming languages. That way it's not so hard if I do go out into the workforce and get a job in computational chemistry and they expect me to know a lot of these things. I want to be ready for that because when you're in a computational chemistry program as a PhD student, you probably didn't take any programming classes in your undergrad because it's not required. It's ne it was never required. So like I didn't, I never learned any of that kind of information. So that always seemed like it was something that if you really wanted to know it, you should have just learned it on your own. So. Okay. Uh, sounds good. I feel like there's some saying about uh, it doesn't matter like the the path you got here, but uh, you know, you're here now. <laughs> it's, it's time to learn programming. Yeah, yeah. That's, Although I can't, yeah, that's right. I really can't relate with the uh, the not not feeling the need to write a script. I, as you know, yeah. I think yes. one time, I think two summers ago, summer before last, I spent like three days working on a script to regenerate tables of data yeah so that when we had to rerun calculations i wouldn't have to touch anything by hand they would like yeah. it would fetch the I, I was working on like a whole build pipeline that would download the files from the supercomputer yeah. process them all do all the statistics and spit out the exact tables i needed for the uh for the paper right yeah <laughs> so i i go to like the opposite extreme of and this is, this is why being lazy is a virtue for programmers. It's like, I'm too lazy to update these tables manually, so I will spend literally three work days trying yeah. to automate it. Right. Well, you see, that's the thing, though, is like, if that's, like, that's something that I hate doing, too, but you did it for me, you know what I mean? Like, you've yeah. already done that, so, like, I'm not going to waste my time learning how to do it on my own. Yeah, yeah. Because you, I already have that, like, you've already made that, and it's something right. that I already use. Cause I mean, like I, I use, I use at least a version of something like that. Every time something finishes, I just press a button and I have all, I have the full table that I need. True. I slap that straight into my LaTeX document and it's done. Like I don't, I literally don't think about it again. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, sounds good. Let's get started. Okay. I think, yeah. So my role here, I guess. Uh, I'm going to try to help you avoid that frustration of the whole. So I'll try to ask you, you know, leading questions. I'll try to fill in gaps in your knowledge of the language itself. So that okay. hopefully you don't encounter any of those like major frustrations. Okay. But I'm not, I'm going to try not to just like uh, dictate code to you like I was doing in the Emacs video. Because today <laughs> is actually about uh, thinking through stuff. And I was really yes. encouraged, actually, by what you said last time about um, talking through things in words. So we'll, we'll try to do that. We may even try writing writing some of it down as pseudocode. And I think that's really okay. helpful. Like, if you can articulate what you want the computer to do, then the last step is really just basically a technical level. Like, you just have to go through the documentation and find the parts of the language to do the things yeah. you already know you want to do. Yeah. So... We'll be practicing that as well. All right. Well, um, I just, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, I will say though, have, please be patient with me. I'm going to do my <laughs> best. Yeah. 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 And all, and everybody else that's watching the video, please be patient with me. <laughs> I'm not a programmer by trade. <laughs> I'm a construction worker by trade. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Anyway, let's hop to your terminal. All right. We're going to make a new cargo oh project. That's we'll be in Emacs most of the video, everybody. Don't worry. But we do want to I usually run cargo new in the terminal. 
So just go to whatever directory you want to put this stuff in. Oh man, uh, I'll just go to pro. I'll just go to projects. That seems like a good place. And I'll make a. Don't make any directory. Direct okay, cargo new. Huh? Yeah, cargo will do that for you. So cargo new, and then yeah, you have to give it a name. Okay, I'll just do. I like it. Does it need to be in quotes or anything? No, I mean I okay. guess if it had spaces in it, it would have to be in quotes. Okay. It's just it's Proper. basically like you're doing Mictor. Okay. All right, uh, so just do that and then go uh, go open it up in Emacs and then go to the Crawford project. I'm gonna take a couple more bites of food. Okay, that sounds good. All right, let's see. Hey yo. Wait, open the directory in Emacs. When it, uh, when Just I do open, cargo, open the uh, the main.rs file. I didn't know that that's what that did. You'll find it. Okay. Uh, find a file. We want to go to projects and then the Crawford projects and then oh look at that! It made me a Cersei directory. Hey, yo, oh look at that. Okay. Well, I guess I already see here the basic form of a function. And the name of a function, the main function. This is where all the magic, like in Go, I guess, this is where the magic happens. Yep. Nice. This is the main event. This is the main, yeah, the main event. Okay, print so, line. Yeah, one thing you can do before you go look at the instructions is just actually try to compile this. So again, everybody, go check out my last video with Zach if you want to see us working together to build his emacs configuration yeah. where we set up everything he needs for rust today all right um, so i'm just gonna compile it yeah let's see that? if he remembers how to compile nope that wasn't it oh, oh i think it was supposed to hit that was close yeah you hit yep so he's using project.el to run project commands uh, uh, oh you may actually have to add this as a project Oh. I don't know. Okay. I actually I usually use projectile, but we're restricting uh Zach to uh as many default packages as possible. Oh man. Okay, hold on. I I want to say it's like control X and then something, right? Wait, you wait, just do exactly what you were doing, but but don't cancel it. Okay. Select the project. Choose a dir. Choose what? Yeah, 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 yeah. And then select the root directory. Uh I think you should abort. Abort, abort. Because okay, you so don't want to select X, the source you directory, you want to select the root directory. Yeah, so back oh, so off this, source. Okay, I, okay. And then hit control P or uh, up arrow or something. Uh, wait, one more? One more? Oh, geez. Maybe you take the slash off? Okay, yeah, just. No. Yeah, yeah, there. Okay. And now, <laughs> I guess F and enter. Okay, okay, so viewers, I would probably recommend projectile. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Project EL seems a little bit uh, rougher around the edges, perhaps. Okay, it's going, it's going real good right now. So now I'll try to compile. Can you yeah, hear my chair okay. squeaking? Yes. Okay, I should probably try to stop moving. <laughs> oh, perfect. All right. Yeah, I guess give I, it a compile. I guess I, well, hold on. I get. I. Well, I can't. Perfect. Yeah, I don't remember how to get to the make. Or oh. The compile thing. Is it? It's so. Is it, yeah. Control X P is called the prefix for Project El. Yeah. So everything after that, you can actually hit question mark here and it'll open a buffer telling you all the options. Oh, nice. Oh, so it's PC to compile? Yep. Oh, I did not know that. Okay, perfect. So if I do control X, P, C, make dash K. Um, I guess actually in your case, you don't have a make file. 
So yeah. if you just want to run a Rust project, you can just use cargo run as your compile command. Okay. And that should do it. And if I now okay Hello. now the, okay okay all right all right all right okay hello world f five f five f five f five f five okay perfect okay great well that compiled that's good yo okay um well I guess that. I just need to go look at the Crawford project and see what the first task is for the first project, huh? Yep. All right, perfect. All right, so for the first Crawford project, project number one is just the molecular geometry and rotational constant analysis. All right. So the first thing here is, uh, the first thing that it wants us to do is to read the coordinate data from input. Okay, so the input to the program is the set of Cartesian coordinates of the atoms in the units of Bohr. I'm not going to read the rest of that to you. So I guess the first thing that I need is I probably need to grab an input file. Well, I guess I don't have to. I, I guess I can like, I well, I guess I should grab the input file. Um, it's probably easier to copy and paste. Okay. Unless you want to clone like, oh, the whole repo, it can be kind of difficult to... I guess you can download single files but yeah um okay so actually this is a question that i have so when it comes to if i wanted to make this like an external file out of main outside of main.rs do i need to put it in the source directory no the uh, source directory should be reserved for rust files okay. and this is so, actually uh for both you and everybody watching this is a big reason that I use either Project EL or Projectile to make sure I'm compiling from the root directory. Because if you do that, all of the file paths that you write in your file, will, in your Rust code files, will also be relative to the root directory. So you could put this in the root of your uh, Crawford projects directory and then right. just refer to it as like geom.txt. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Okay. Or what I often so. do is make a test files directory. And so then you oh, just refer okay. to it as test files slash geom.txt. Okay. That makes sense. Because if we get far enough in here, I'll show you how to write some tests too. But for now, we're just going to stick. We're going to try to write everything inside of main. We're not going to worry about functions or tests or anything for now. Okay. All right. So in Emacs, how would I like make a new directory? So if you, like... if you find a file in a directory that doesn't exist, it will just make it for you. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, cool. So if I, so if I did like test files and yep. then like that, and then I did geom.txt. Yep. Oh, dude, that is so cool. Perfect. Beauty. And save Money. that, and it should... I think it'll ask you if you want to create the directory, but you can just say yes. Yep. Yeah, dude. Please. Okay, perfect. All right. Now I can go control XP, switch back to this buffer, switch yep. back to this. Okay. So the input... All right, so I got to read the coordinate data from input. So I guess the first thing I need to do is figure out how to open the file and then read the file... And I guess the easiest thing to test if that worked is just to print the file again, or at least to print the contents of the file. Okay. Sweet. Beautiful. Okay. So now I guess I need to look at the document. I need to look at the documentation in order to figure out how I want to do that. Cause I don't, you know, in Rust, I don't know how to open a file for reading specifically. I guess I need to just start there. Sounds good to me. Um, I think I'm going to start eating. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you search okay. file in the documentation, you will be, uh, You'll probably find what you want. Okay, perfect. All right, so I'm gonna search for file, file and the documentation. Uh, uh, You're searching the book. I, should I have done this instead? Yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. File. Okay. An object providing access to an open file. All right. Well, 
Okay, an object providing access to an open file. So an instance of a file, examples. So here's an example. Creates a new file and writes bytes to it. Okay, well, now I want to do read the contents of a file into a string. What are you? What are you? What are you doing? What are you smiling about over there? Am I doing something wrong? No, I'm just impressed by the documentation. I mean, look at these examples. Um, yeah, these are pretty. What, these are pretty neat examples. Remind me what you wanted to do again. I just want to read. I want to read the contents of a file. Read Sounds the like contents you're in the right place. <laughs> <laughs> Into a string. Okay, so it looks here then that I need to do that. That whole thing right there. Whoa, what is this question mark here for? Is there a way for me to click on it? What's going on? Yeah, we'll have to talk about that. Just go ahead and copy it for now. <laughs> okay. All right. So back to eglot. I funk main. I guess I don't need this anymore, but I guess I can tweak that in a second. So I'm going to do this. Oh, I don't. Oh, wait. This is going to be on the outside of this. Okay, so this might be a good time to talk about the question mark operator. <laughs> uh, hmm. Yeah, I was really, I was really impressed by the, the example that told you exactly what you needed to do. Um, but it's already added a lot of, uh, a lot of like syntax features. Okay. Yes. So Rust is very careful about operations that could fail uh-huh so basically anything that can fail actually put your cursor on um on result up above and hit control c d i'm not sure that that's actually bound okay type uh meta x l doc e l doc yeah try that Okay, there you go. <clears throat> so, pretty much anything in Rust that can fail, uh, you know, when, when Rust is well-written. So, there are ways around this where you can just panic, or you do something called unwrapping that just crashes. But yeah. most things in Rust that can fail will return a result. And okay. when you look up at the top, it says pub type result t uh, less than t greater than t. So okay, <laughs> we're already talking a little bit about generics. So that means that result is generic over some type t. So it says equals result t comma error. So a result can either be okay with some value inside of it. Okay. Exactly. Or it can be error with some other value inside of it. Okay, so it can be one of okay, it can be one of two things. Either the result is good and it's fine, we it's good, it's whatever, or yeah. it's not good. So here you go. Here's an error for you. Exactly. And so this is a way so in Go, well, I, I'm not going to I'm going to try to avoid talking about other languages. I know I did that last time we were learning uh, actually when we were learning Go, I think. So I, I'm not going to refer to any other languages. So Uh, yeah, this, this is a, basically a way to encode success and failure at the type level. So the, the compiler, without even running the code and finding out that something bad happened, when you run it, the compiler knows if you've handled both cases or not. Okay. So what the question mark does is it takes one of these results and it either, oh, Oh, it actually oh, does dude. tell you. Oh, that's so cool. Okay. So it used in question mark to decide whether the operator should produce a value or propagate a value block to the caller. Yep. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. <laughs> but yeah. basically what it does is if there's an error, it returns that error. And if there's not an error, it just gives you the value inside. Or propagate a value. <clears throat> yes. Okay. So this is actually 
Oh, okay, okay. I see. So the produced value or the produced value would be like the error because it's something that you wanted to work didn't work. Or no. Yeah. I, this this documentation is actually kind of confusing. <laughs> well, cause, all right. So if I'm if I'm what up with all right, just for the um, context on the screen. So okay, the the best way to explain this actually. Well, go ahead with what you were saying. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, that's okay. Uh, so, all right. I don't know what let mute file or let mut file. I don't know what it, that does just yet. But I'm assuming that just says here's like we're we're calling a file or we're setting a file. I don't know yet. I'm assuming that it says file open the file. The question mark is if the file does not exist, we can throw or it throws up an error. Yes. Okay. So, okay. The, <laughs> this, yeah, this is why, like, this is bringing in so many things at one time. So a result is actually an enum. I think we looked briefly at enums the other day. But enums let you say that a thing can either be uh, one thing or another thing. <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah. Like, you can have an enum fruit, and the fruit yeah. mm -hmm. can either yep. be an apple or an orange. I see. Something yeah. like that. But the important thing with this is that enums can be exhaustive. So that if you use this other thing called a match... It for the compiler forces you to handle every case. So okay, if you delete this question mark, mm -hmm. let's go ahead and let's do this because this actually should make it more clear what the question mark is doing. This is how okay. it's usually presented first before you use the question mark. Okay, so go to the question mark, take it out, <clears throat> take out the semicolon. Well, actually, you see the type. See how the type changed. To result yes, yeah. file error mm -hmm. yeah okay go before file open and put and write match but what match that's right okay match yep. space and then yeah go back to the end of the line okay those inlay hints are kind of annoying with how they jump around uh no no take that out so this is like this is like um basically a sequence of ifs so there's going to be curly braces after this. Just do an I'd open like... and close and then a semicolon. And then escape. And go back to the... Uh, go to the file. <laughs> We're going to try to use the language server to write some of the code for us. So if you type... Uh, I always bind mine to control C A. I don't know if... Uh, Just type meta x, eglot, code, actions. Okay. Well, that's upsetting. Go go back. Put your curly braces back. I think that's why it's upset. No oh, wait. What did wait? What happened to him? Why did they go away? You hit undo. Oh. <laughs> Semicolon. Okay. Back on the file. Let's try the code actions again. All right. I'm going to be Meta upset X, if this doesn't work. You got code actions. Oh, look at that. Fill Take match arms. Yes. Beautiful. Okay. So there you go. That's what we were trying to say with the question mark. There are two options for what comes out of file open. It okay. can either be okay or it can be an error. Okay. Okay. Or error. So this is just the syntax of a match statement. You've got something a thing on the left that you're pattern matching basically and then you have to have this little arrow and then you have some block of code that happens in that case so yeah if you go there delete that underscore and just put an f and you'll see yep the inlay hint says that f is a file so okay. this means you successfully opened the file. Okay. So in that case, you can just, instead of that to do, you can just give it an F. Give what an F? Just remove the whole to do up to the comma and then just say F. 
Okay. So does this? I mean, does this make sense? I I guess. So the match uh, says call file open. Yes. Look at what it returns. If it returns me okay, holding a file, just give me back the file. Okay. So this sense. thing on the the thing we're doing on the left, it says it gave me an okay variant, is what it's called of the enum. Okay. And that variant contains an actual file. So I just want to unwrap it, take off take off the okay, and just I just want the file. <laughs> Okay, that makes sense. That's good. And then, actually, in the error case, we could do something similar if um, we could actually look at the type of the error and do something in the block. But okay, in our case, we didn't really want to do anything with the error. We just wanted to like to exit the file. Okay. So we can actually leave it like it is and just have yeah. it say to do. So if you fail to open the file, it's just going to trigger that to do. Okay. Does that all make right. sense? Perfect. So that's why yeah. people like the question mark operator because it does all of this for you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Do you like the question mark operator? Yeah. Or would you or would you rather know that that's or I don't know. No, I mean, I know that the question mark operator does this for me, so I, I like it. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Although in this case, <laughs> there's something else that you can do that's actually a bit it's kind of dirty and you don't want to do this in like real rust code, but there's a method on results called unwrap that, uh -huh. that just unwraps it kind of like the question mark does, but it panics if it fails. So okay. you'll notice that the, the main function here, unlike your hello world, it actually returns a result itself. Yeah. This thing right here, right? Because I'm assuming this means that here's the function. This is what yep. it returns. Exactly. So the main function is allowed to optionally return a result like this just so that you can use question mark inside of it. But if we didn't want to do that, which I wouldn't have done if we hadn't copied the example from the book, <laughs> is you can just write file open dot unwrap. And that, that will either give you the F or it will fail. Like the, the program okay. will just crash, which is a bit simpler. Okay. But fortunately now we've gotten to talk about the question mark we've gotten to talk about match we talked about enums and variants and all kinds of stuff uh, all just to open a simple file huh oh boy all right so i have a question about yep. what what is this up here then like are these like just packages like i don't know what these are yeah I mean, yeah I, so this i, I the... see that it says it says mod right yeah here. they're called modules in rust okay so like use the, the standard module inside the standard module we're going to use the the fs sub module yep and file within system. that we're going to use we're going to use the file struct exactly okay and then prelude is just a and then what does this star mean is it just mean like everything within yep. prelude we're yeah gonna just use? like okay. in the shell okay, that makes and sense. prelude is not actually a special name but it's idiomatic to put a bunch of things in prelude that people are likely to want so you can just okay. import prelude star i also never do that um yeah because what it's importing is actually a trait which is that we talked briefly about this the other day but a trait basically defines some set of behavior for something that can have so when you go down a couple lines farther and you call file dot read to string I think read to string is provided by the read trait. Okay. So you have to import the read trait for it to be in scope, for you to actually be able to call that function. I see. So instead of calling standard, or instead of using standard IO read directly, you can just import the prelude. Okay. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> there you All go. Right, well, that's that's a lot from uh, from this. Yeah, <laughs> no kidding. What, how do I how do I add a comment? Uh, uh, slashes forward slashes, two of them. Okay. Or just use a question mark. <laughs> and instead of match. Okay, perfect.
All right. So then moving on from, all right, actually, all right. Another question. I'm assuming that let is this, we're just saying let, if there was no mute, obviously we would just say, let there be a variable called file. Okay. But this mute from my limited understanding from reading like the, like the first chapter of the Rust book, mute is just saying, let there be this, this, this variable called file that we, we will change, we can change later if we want to. Okay. Because if we just said, let file, whatever we set file to, it won't change for the rest of the time that we use it. Right. That's right. Yeah. You're all, okay. you're all right. Okay. All right. Perfect. So let mute file, meaning that we're going to do something to file or that we can change files later, I guess. I don't, I mean, it, I, but okay, in this case, is the change that we're doing to file this file that read to string? And you can see this. Yeah, yeah, you can see this. Look on the right side. Mm -hmm. Fn read to string. It takes a ref mute self, which means you have to have a, re a mutable reference to whatever is before the dot. Okay, all right, that makes so sense. So again, honestly, when I do this, I usually build up the code like a lot more incrementally. Instead of, uh -huh. I guess we should have done that instead of pasting it in. But yeah. like, I usually don't have my variable be mutable by default. And then when I get to a function call like this, I'm like, oh, it needs it to, be to be mutable. So I go back and I put mute on. Okay, that makes sense. But yeah, All you right. can always tell this from the, and that's that's helpful for you as a user too. Like if you pass something off, okay, I, I am programming Python a lot for work now, right? You never know in Python, if you pass something to a function, is it gonna get modified in that function? Okay. You don't know. So a lot of people in Python, they'll do what's called a defensive copy. So you'll make your you'll make a copy and you'll send that to the function just in case they mess with it. Okay. But in Rust, every function tells you, does it take it by value? Which means you give it away, you can't get it back. Unless, I mean, unless the function returns it to you. So that would be a plain self. Yeah. Does it take an immutable reference, which is just an ampersand self? It's most people pronounce it ref. Or okay. does it take a mutable reference? In this case, it takes ref mute self. Okay. So you know I'm giving you this self, and it might not come back the same. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if I need it this way, then I know I need to copy it. Okay. Yeah. All right, so now we have let mute content. So we're making another variable called contents. Yep. And the contents are just, it's just a new string. Yep. Or it's just, it's just a string. Yeah, this is a new string. So this... New is specific, though. Yeah, creates a new empty string. You'll see there. Okay, perfect. And then after that, this is where we actually mute the file, or we do something to the file where we, we read to string yeah. the contents... So let me put read to string on that way I can see what, yep. so it takes at, it takes, that's, so the ampersand you said is ref. Okay. So it, so the ref mute self, so it takes ref mute self. And then what is the syntax or what does this mean here? So this B, so this B U F colon, what does that mean? Boof. What does boof mean? Oh, you're chewing. Okay. Look at you. Look at you go. I'll just keep reading that. Uh, this function buff? returns a number of... Sorry. Buff is a variable name. So we've been talking a lot about functions that take self. Self is a special case where you don't have to like give it a name and a type. Sure. But in general, when you have a function, you give the argument a name. In this case, buff, because it's a buffer. Okay. And then you put a colon, and then you put the type of the argument. So the way I would read this is buff is a ref mute string. So a mutable reference to a string. Mutable reference to a string. Yep. I guess I still, I just don't understand really what the ampersand is. Like, I don't yep. know what that syntax means. Yeah. A mutable variable. Yeah. Mute so you've probably heard of a pointer. Yeah, but I don't really know what it is. Yeah, so so a pointer is basically the address of something. So mm -hmm. 
Rust actually makes this really clear. If this did not take ref mute string, let's say it just said buff colon string, then that would be what's called a move in Rust. That would mean that this function, when you called it on buff, it would take ownership of buff away from you so that you could not use buff anymore afterwards. Okay. So that's just called a move. And you can think of that as the object lives somewhere in the memory on your computer. And okay. when someone when ownership is transferred, it actually gets moved out of that memory and put somewhere else. So that's why it's called a move. Okay. okay. And then once it's out of that memory, we can't access it again? We can't access it anymore because we actually don't know where it is. Okay. That makes sense. So I guess it's... All right. So it's the same... It's kind of like the same... It's almost like the same idea as like the mute, like let mute file. Well, hold on. Okay. So, so that's a move, right? You can also, yes. you can do what's called a borrow, mm -hmm. which leaves a thing in the place and you let somebody borrow it. Wait, and this is what's like called a pointer in other languages. If you've heard that. So essentially, instead of taking the object itself, you're taking its address and handing it off to somebody else. Okay. So that it's and, still okay. in the same memory location and you both know where it is. Okay. So that's a borrow. You can let somebody borrow it. And that would just be a plain ref. Okay. Uh, one, and it would just say buff colon ampersand string. But Rust has this added element of whether a borrow, in that case, can be mutable or immutable. And this, okay. don't take, don't think too much about this, but I'm going to say it just to be precise. This is really helpful when you're thinking about like multi-threaded programming. Okay. Because you're allowed to have multiple immutable references, basically multiple readers. Like multiple people can look at the value of something at one time, but you can only have one mutable reference. Okay. Because multiple people can't try to change the thing at a time. Yeah, right. Okay, that makes sense. But until we get to something like that, you can basically just think of it as ref mute and ref being the same thing. It's just, I need to use this again later, so I'm only letting you borrow it. You can't move out of my memory. Okay. So because we actually want to get the contents of the string back, uh, we have to pass it a reference. Okay. All right, so that's what that did. That's what that does. Yeah. Okay. We're essentially taking the contents of the file and putting it in a new string. Yep. All right. And then now this down here says assert underscore eq macro asserts that two expressions are equal to to each other. Oh, okay. So this would assume that is this like a test almost? Like it just yes. says that if if the contents say hello world yes then then we're okay yep okay that makes sense so you should actually delete that because your file is not going to say hello world <laughs> right yeah. that was just part of the example so rust yeah. this is like really a minor thing but rust has this concept of doc tests mm -hmm. so it will, when you run the documentation or generate the documentation it will, or when you run tests i think it will actually look for examples in your code and run those <laughs> That's so cool. that actually gets run in the documentation but nice. for your case you don't need that yeah right okay so we don't need this and yep. we don't need that you actually do need the okay if you want to leave the return value on your main function the return value this yeah if you want to delete that oh, right, then right, right, you can right, get right. rid of the okay right but we don't do we i mean we don't necessarily want to right we don't want to delete that well, you are still using... Yeah, you don't want to delete it because you're still using a question mark on read to string. Because that can oh, also true. fail. This this is... I mean, Rust is interesting because it actually makes you think about all the things that can fail. Like, I could fail to open the file. I could yeah. have an open file and fail to read from it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, obviously we know that we're not reading from foo.txt. True. We're going to be reading from... And this is a path. Is it a? Is it like a? Do I? I can just. Is it a local path? Can I just put a local path in here? Yep. Yeah. So like dot dot slash. No 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 no. Remember remember we're compiling from the root of the project. 
This is why we did that. No dot dot slash. Oh, oh. It's all from the root. Right, that's right. That's right. That's right. Yep. So test files and then it was geom dot txt. Okay, great. All right. So now we can read dot file dot read to string. And then as long as all this goes okay, we're 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 cool. Okay. But I want to print the contents. I want to print that to the screen. So now I guess I can open this. Now I guess I need to think about if I just do the, the print line X clam. I can, that's fine because I'm not trying to format this. I just want to know that it's actually reading it. So I can just do print ln. I mean, what the heck? Oh. Yeah, I'm just going to cut it out of mine. All right. So, if, so print line this. Uh -oh, did I do something wrong here? Yeah. So in Rust, you may have seen in other programming languages, you actually have to write return. Oh. Um, uh -huh. You don't have to write return in Rust because everything evaluates to some value. And you, you can just return a value directly. So okay. you actually need that okay at the very bottom of the function. Okay. So it, and you need it without a would... semicolon. Because the, the semicolon okay. actually prevents it from being returned. I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. So what do I do here? Um, you were, you oh, were wait, on this, the right oh, track. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, you just okay. need to do it before the okay. So I need to do this. Yep. And then is it is it in is it like is it in parentheses? Is it in parentheticals? Yeah. Okay. So then I just do. So oh. macros are special because they have the exclam, um, mm -hmm. but you still call them like functions after that. Okay. All right. Now I guess I want to see if it actually compiles, huh? So let me. See. Okay. Let me save it. Let me see. Yeah. All go right, for it. Yeah. It. Yeah. I I actually would have been running it before now even. All right, look at that. So it said, you might be missing a string literal to format with. Okay, so it suggests that I need to put, I need to add this here, these here, and then that, and then a comma. Could not compile, okay, that's fine. Okay, well that still says it's upsetting spaghetti, not anymore, okay, perfect. Hey, look at that. We did it. Okay. So I guess this print line, this is still some form of like formatting that I had to do on the contents of it. Yeah. So all of the print and write macros, like the compiler told you, they require a literal string for the formatting. So yeah, you usually end up having to do that. Okay. I really like that it told me. It was like, here's yeah. a hint of what you should do. That's really nice. No I really like that. That's really nice. Now, if you want to print something a little dirtier and quickly, you can use dbg exclam. Because that, you mm -hmm. can just put contents directly in. So that uses a different formatting scheme. It uses yeah. a debug printing instead of um, like nice printing, display printing. Like formal printing. Yeah. But it's a little, okay. but it, it's faster to write, you know. All right. Well, hey, look at that. I did it. You did it. Yeah, you could. Do you want, you you want to commit this? What do you mean? What do you mean commit? Like in Git. Are you gonna track this in Git? Oh yeah, I didn't even think about. I mean, that. you don't have to put it on GitHub, but just you know, practice Git stuff too, you know. Yeah. Initial, I mean, I would like initial commit I... load load geometry from file. Boom. Yeah. Do I have mag git installed? Oh, I do. I do have it installed. You do? Yeah, because this is my, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I use on my work, remember yesterday when we were working, or two days ago, yeah. on my workstation, I was committing stuff. I changed my init.l to this one. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. Uh, uh, control, control X. X G. G, yeah. Control X, G. No. Uh-oh. Are you sure? No, I thought well, you did that at work. Oh, I did. Oh, man. Ugh. All right, go back. We can add a couple things to your init L anyway. Okay, that, all right, fine. But you, fine, do you remember how to install uh, Maggot? I'm going to try to... I'm going to finish my biscuit, then I'm done eating.
Wait, what do you mean? You mean just like using the, you mean like in the init.l? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not like some special thing or anything. Uh, use dash pack magit ensure oh that's an l ensure t baby it's working it's working ayo maggot magpie Checking, checking. Man, being thrust straight into into all that syntax was a bit un, un unnerving, dude. That's a bit unnerving. All right, so that's installed. Is there anything else that you wanted me to add? You said we wanted to make a couple changes. Uh. Actually, I think that's good. We'll just do it in Rust mode for now. Okay. Um, yeah, go down to your bind. Okay. Add a new set of parens. A new set of parens, so like yeah. here? Yep, yep. Okay. Okay, so I usually bind um, LDOC to control C, D. Uh, no, no less than. That's only for the F, F keys. Yeah. Um, and then yep dot. Uh, I think it was just L doc, right? Yeah, it was just L doc. Okay, and then go over one, and then another pair of parens. Oh uh, no, 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 no! Not like close. Like add another binding. Oh 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 okay. okay. And then for this one, I usually do. Um, I think I do Control C A. This is for your code action. Okay. What was the? Do you remember what it was? It was like I think it was eglot dash code dash oh, actions. Yeah. It was yeah eglot code actions. Okay. And then that's it. So yeah, close that paren, and then go down under outside the whole use package and evaluate. Okay. Perfect. Beauty. Money. Okay. All right. Perfect. Personally, do you like how long it takes company to act up? Or do you want it to be faster, slower? I haven't noticed right yet that it's slow or fast. Okay. I, okay. So, like, I don't, I don't know yet. All right, we'll leave that alone for now, then. Yeah, that's fine. All right, perfect. Hop back over. I hate my life. <laughs> hitting the wrong freaking buttons i need oh, to get i need to get better I, I need to get better at using the keyboard without like looking at it i'm so bad <laughs> at that. I, I had i had um i had my wife do the monkey typer yeah the other day uh she can type 20 words up faster a minute than i can no yeah i'm really slow at typing yeah yeah as people probably noticed in the last video. Um, well, it's hard with... I was giving you the benefit of the doubt with programming because some of these symbols are hard even for me to reach. Like when I start no, typing brackets and stuff. No, don't give me the benefit of the doubt. It's because I'm slow. All right. Yeah. Well, anyway, <laughs> we got the geometry. Oh, do you want to commit? Did you do it? No, I know I've not committed yet. Control okay. X, G. Okay, untracked files. Oh man, hold on. I don't remember how to do this. I wrote it down at work because I knew I was going to forget. So uh, the first step is to stage your changes. So you do that so with S. S. Yep. S, S. Staged. Uh, and, then, and then, wasn't it? It's like Control C, Control C. No, that's how you finish your commit. So again, you can okay. hit question mark here and it, it shows you all the commands. I didn't know that. Okay, I, I forgot that. Let me see. <laughs> Okay, so if I wanted to commit, is it just control C, C? Nope, it's just C. It's just exactly what it says. 
Oh, okay. So C. And then ignore everything and just look bottom left, bottom left, buddy. <laughs> and okay. C again. Okay. Commit. All right, sweet. I started a project. Yep. Uh, started the crop. Crawford pro, pro, projects. <laughs> um, so I don't I don't want to tell you right. how to write your own commit messages, but Perfect. the name of the project of your project is Crawford underscore proj. Oh yeah, start to be. Uh, <laughs> so it might it might be clear that you're starting the Crawford projects. There you go perfect look at that oh wow beautiful no i guess i'll just this is fine red contents of a of a file <laughs> oh yeah all right perfect now is it control now c control, it's control c, c. Control c. Uh, okay perfect that's perfect just leave it like that if you want to push it to github later we can set that up but for now it's you just got your local git history all right sounds good so now that I've committed the stuff, um, yeah, like you said, we can set up the we can set up the if I wanted to set up a Git repo for this kind of stuff later, we can do that. Yeah. Um, now that I've read the file, um, I've seen the contents of it, so I know that it worked properly. Uh, I I need to go back to the document, or at least I need to go back here to see what the next step is. Yeah. Okay. So the first line above, blah blah blah. We got that part. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh my lord oh nice dark theme dude i think Please if you drag don't... it you might be able to drag it somewhere else okay there we go oh no all right so this is gonna be... all right so this is i think this is where it's gonna get a little rough huh so now we need to calculate the inner atomic bond distances using the expression. Well, yes, but you might want to look a little bit more at the first step. So, oh, 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 okay. If you recall, you have a single string containing all of the coordinates. Oh, yeah, no, I need to break it into its individual pieces. Yeah. Yeah. True. True. Read the data from each line into appropriate variables and close the file. Okay. All right. So there's a little bit more I got to do here. Yeah. So essentially, I've just read it all into a string. Yep. Um, and for future reference, there's actually a function in Rust uh, called read to string that will do all of those lines that you wrote wait what there's there is there's a function just called read to string uh-huh that does all of those steps that you did all of these steps here yeah oh all right hold on i want to look at that then but we had a lot of fun reading the documentation and finding an example read the string uh see so oh no it did come up this here no it's um it's standard oh, stud <laughs> i always just say standard some people say like stud or something okay i i but when i mean std i'll say standard fs read to string is the function you're looking for okay you may Standard. have to you may have to search it but it might not come up you mean like search it specifically yeah okay so like this and yep. then fs oh okay now read, read to underscore to string <laughs> is 
This oh my god. All right. <laughs> This is a convenience function for using <laughs> file open and registering the fewer imports without an intermediate variable. This function will return an error if path does not already exist. Other errors may also be returned according to options. Okay. So I could have just used this. Yeah. But this just does everything that I've already done. Like it doesn't. Yeah. Okay. So, does, so I still... I'm pretty sure if you click source in the top right, it, it's probably going to look exactly like what you wrote. Yeah, look at that. Well, kind of. Yeah. So this, you instead of allocating just a plain new string with string new, you can call string colon colon with capacity to um, tell it how big you expect the string to be. Okay. So as an optimization, they're allocating the buffer, the buffer string, buff, remember? Um, yes. With a size, if they can detect the size. Okay. <clears throat> All right. But yeah, pretty much right. what you wrote. Okay. So now I need to finish doing this little, this little thing. Because yes. now what I need to do is I need to... Take the take the con take the the lines within contents and then separate them. Yeah, I, I like this motion you're making. This looping motion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, for the lines in the content, you know, yeah. I can I can separate them out. All yeah. Right. Do I need to do that in the main function? Yeah, we can we can do everything in main for now. Okay. At some so point, now, we might uh, want to refactor it, but that's very low priority. Okay. Well, I think then I need to look at how for loops work in Rust. Sure. Um, so I guess I'll go and look at how for loops work. For loops. Oh, I wait. I don't think that's going to come up in the documentation. Object oriented programming results. Uh yeah. So I know. do you know do you know what you want to loop over? What do I want to loop over? Yeah. Uh I mean, would I not want to loop over the contents? Yeah. I was trying to get you to say a specific word. Do you know uh, what how you might want to break up the contents? <laughs> by line okay why don't you try searching lines in the docs not the book i think hopefully okay. we'll get a good example here okay oh look at that an iterator over the lines of an instance of buff read so an iterator over the lines of a string as string slices <laughs> that sounds okay. a little bit more like what you have all right an iterator, an iterator over the lines of a string. I already read that. This struct is created with the lines method on string. Okay. Well, uh, read that last sentence. See, it's documentation for more. So you should be able to click lines there. Okay. So lines are split at line endings that are either new lines or a sequence of a carriage uh, return followed by a line i don't know what that means okay so that means it works on linux or windows cool okay yeah all right so the basic usage of lines is this right here okay so is lines another so lines is like another mutable variable or something yep okay I guess I guess I guess I don't necessarily know how it works. Yeah. So this, okay. Um, so a really big concept in Rust is iterator. So when it says an iterator, that means a lot. <laughs> uh, but the most basic thing you can do with an iterator is call dot next to get the next thing in the sequence. We actually we talked about this a couple days ago. But when you call next, the sequence could be empty. So yes. it actually returns what's called an option. 
which is similar okay. to a result in that it has two possible values. Either it's something or it's nothing. Exactly. It can either be some, as you can see in these or, examples, some foo, some bar, some empty, or it can be or none. Some. Okay. Now, for loops in Rust actually have a magic interaction with iterators in that they can loop over an iterator until it returns none. Oh, cool. So okay. if you want to handle all of the elements in an iterator, you can just say for blank, where blank is whatever variable name you want to use, in iterator, and it'll just, it'll continuously oh. call lines.next in this case until it returns none. So like for, if I, so would that mean if I want to do like four, yep. I'm just going to use basic line yep. in, oh, an iterator. So I want to do contents yep. dot lines. Beautiful. Okay. But does this need one of these because it's yep. a function? Okay. But I need to add this, right? I need, do I need to add dot lines to something or? Nope. I mean, not dot lines to something, but so is this included in this stuff up here or? What I need to nope. add. This is just, this is already imported. Okay, great. So one of the reasons that we added that code action is that the, the LSP will help you with imports. So basically, oh, okay. basically don't worry about imports until if you see some red squiggly, try to put your cursor on it and hit control C A and it'll, if it needs something imported, the LSP should tell you what to import. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so this is a, this is a little red squiggly. How are for loops done? Or tr so like, what do I need to add here for this red squiggly Curly to braces. go away? So like this? Yep. Okay. And okay, then you so can go ahead and line. close it if you really want the squigglies to go away. <laughs> okay. There you go. Okay, so for line in contents dot line. Uh, I guess I need to do. I, I need to store them somewhere. Sure. I mean, something or I like to do. So th this is actually, I don't know if this will make sense to you, but some people are really into like REPL driven development in Python or Lisp or whatever, where you like type commands at the, at the REPL, which is basically like a shell and it, it shows you what comes out. I, okay. I basically do that even with Rust where I will write something and I hit compile, you know, we've got that nice key binding. So yeah, personally what I do anytime I have a loop, just to see what I'm looping over, I'll, I'll just put a print inside of the loop. Okay, so like what I print, I would just print line, print. Yeah, sure. Print, and then... Or you can use debug. This... Yeah? <laughs> what is it? DB, what is it? DBG. DBG. Exclaim. Is it, and that's, that's it. Okay, and then I just need to put like line. line. Perfect. Beautiful. Okay. And now I'll save this. Yep. And then I can hit F5. Uh, you may need a... Uh, well, the compiler will tell you. Okay, so... Uh, this note originates in the macro dbg uh could not compile okay so it expected this but found a string or a ref or a ref string yeah okay so this this error is actually not that helpful um oh, good so what it's telling you is that it expected the body of this for loop to not return a value but it returned line so debug just like passes on the value you give it it prints it and then okay. passes it on so the short answer here is you need to put a semicolon at the end of the line to prevent, oh, oh, prevent oh. line from being returned effectively. Okay. And that should handle it. Okay. Okay. And this actually, yeah, there we go. So you'll see oh, debug nice. gave you a lot more information. It tells you the line in your code. It tells you the name of the variable. And then it put like quotes around everything. Yeah, nice. Okay, <laughs> perfect. So I'm feeling like if I really want, I don't know if this is the next step, but I know that one of the steps is probably going to be breaking up each of these individual lines and then storing that information in a, you know, in a different and something else. Beautiful. Okay. So I'm assuming I don't need another for loop or I might no, I don't need another for loop. Okay. No, because now, so. oh, because right, right. Because now on each line, I just need to break it up by empty space. Yep. Okay. So is there? A, I'm assuming I need to split it. 
Yep, it's that would be a great a... thing to search in the docs. Okay. <laughs> Actually, I think you just Wait. I think you just scrolled past it possibly. Oh, really? I think. But it doesn't hurt to search anyway. Uh, well, yeah, may maybe just search. It might it'll look better at least. Split an iterator over the contents of an instance. No, we don't want that, right? Right. Subs created. So, okay, hold on. Just when you look at these, look at the type on the left. So you can click on that one that says standard stir split, but that is the type that comes out of the split method. So what you really want is two lines below the stir colon colon split. Okay. That's the one you want. Okay. An iterator over substrings of this string slice separated by characters matched by a pattern. And okay. Actually, in this case, you you actually know a little bit more about what you want to split on. So split is like the very general split function. So just just to save you some time, scroll down on the left and look for other things that start with split. Yeah, right there. Let's keep keep scrolling down. I think they're usually alphabetical. So look at all the split options you got. Yeah. Yeah. Split at mute inclusive once on white space. Yep. Okay. Oh, that's neat. Oh, cool. So this, I think, <laughs> is exactly what you had in mind, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if I wanted to go back over here. Would I do that with it? I need to do that within the for loop or yeah. would I do? Okay. And you I can would... actually, you can just tack that on inside of the debug if you want to see what comes out. Oh, nice. It was, it was, it was split. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Uh, and then like that. Yep. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So this is going to be ugly. I'll warn you now. Oh, because of the debug? Yeah, this is a... It's like, it's giving you everything it's got. Okay, all right. Well, can I... I want to see what it looks like by itself. Well, that is what it looks like. So, okay. Um, as you may have seen in the documentation, when you call split whitespace, it returns another iterator. Okay. Um... Something else that you can do with iterators is collect them into a vector. Because an iterator is basically lazy. Like, when you, if you have an iterator, it doesn't actually do anything until you start calling next on it. So, basically, until you, like, literally call next, or unless you put it in a for loop. Or, if you just want to work on everything at one time, you can call dot collect. Okay. <clears throat> Now, for this, you'll probably want to take this out of the debug. So if you hit Control-C, Control-D. Okay, cool. Um, because this is a little bit touchy. Um, I would, yeah, I would go ahead and make a variable for this. Why is it so mad at me? Well, look at your other um, variable definitions. So you've got to have let mute name equals something. Oh, equal the thing. Okay, so I do equal line dot line. Sure. Yeah. And yeah, you can see the type there. It's telling you that that is a split white space. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, let's try collecting this into a vector. So a vector is, you can think of it as like a list, basically. Okay. It's just a sequence of objects of the same type. Okay. So you can actually just write dot collect at the end of the line. At the end of dot white space dot, yeah. I can do, okay. Because split white space returns an iterator, and then collect is a method on an iterator. Okay. Now, the one wrinkle here is that collect itself is generic because you can collect into different things like you could collect into a hash map not that 
you need to know what that is yet. But you can collect into different things. So you often have to tell collect what you want to collect into. <laughs> okay. And the way that you can do that is similar. Actually, it's exactly what it's showing you with these inlay hints. You okay. just go over to the variable name. And after the variable name, you put a colon and then you put the type. So go over to line before the equals. Okay. And you put a colon. Actually, why don't you try to compile this, but without it, and just see what it says. Just as, okay. as good practice. Oh, yeah, I want to save it. <laughs> okay. Consider giving line an explicit type. Okay. And you okay. can actually, yeah, paste in exactly what it tells you there. Nice. Wait, what? You forgot the oh, okay. colon. Colon. It's like a, it's like one, it's not, it's just like one little, one little guy. Huh? It's got one little X clam over here and it's giving me a little blue squiggle. Yeah. So at the bottom, it's telling you what's going on. It says you have an unused variable. And it also does not need to be mutable. Which is okay. That's just a warning. Oh, okay. Unused variable. Variable does not need to be mutable. Okay. All right. So if you wanted to use it, you could debug line. This will be more interesting to look at. Okay. Which is the reason that I, I had you go through all that collecting. The pain, the pain of collecting. Okay. So now... Now I now I need to do now I would debug line. Yeah, if you want to. Okay, so I would do a dbg line. Yep. Probably. All right, perfect. Full on. Yep. And that will take care of the uh, the unused warning. It'll still be mad that it's mutable, but that's okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, but there we go. And nice. that looks a little bit more reasonable, I think. Yeah. That's cool. Oh, man, that's so cool. Yeah. Oh, so that's... Okay, so this is the atom. Yep. And this is X, Y, or Z. Yep. Or X, Y, and Z, I guess. Okay, that's cool. All right, nice. I guess I don't need to make it mutable then. I can just leave it... A, I can just take that out, or would you recommend leaving mute No, nope, yeah, take it out. Okay. Cool. <laughs> That's so nippy. And now if you compile right. again, it, it won't show that warning at the top. <laughs> Dude, that is so cool. Yep. All right, nice. Huh. So this vector, it's like a, it's like a, that's interesting. Okay, cool. Okay, so now that I have all that. Here, why don't you summarize what we just did? Because this, okay, is, a, this right, is a really right. useful pattern to, to use in the future. Okay, so essentially what I had done is I took the contents of this file that I just read, and then I said that for every line in that file, I split it on the on the white space. So I split it on the spaces. Yep. And then I collected all of that into some vector or into some list, I guess. Yeah, um, it is a vector. Call it a vector. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I split all of that and collected it into a vector. So now what we have is just a collection of all of the lines, but each of the lines are split into its own yep. its own list. Yeah. I mean, it is a vector. The, the You can think of it as a list if that helps you. I don't... You may... Without any other languages, you may not have actually any useful association from list. So you, if you if just vector is good with you, just call it a vector. I, I okay. It's just, just as you to... can see on the right, it's just a sequence of elements. Yeah, it's a sequence of elements. Okay. And the nice thing about a vector is that you can index into it. Ooh. So do you have any? You might have a guess for this. If you wanted to print the first or potentially zeroth element of every line. Do you have an yes. idea for how you might do that? I mean, yeah. I mean, I would just say, like, if I wanted to print that, I would just do, like, line zero. 
Yeah, give that a try. Pretty neat. All right. Pretty good stuff. Okay. All right, you got to hit F6, too. That that curly brace is killing me. What curly brace? <laughs> All right, fine. Fine. <laughs> Whatever. Okay. Don't get mad at me. All right, perfect. Okay, so now that we've done that, back to what we were... Okay, wait. Let me at least read the documentation. Just yeah, to back see. to our regularly scheduled programming. Okay, so read the data from each line into appropriate variables. Okay. Are, is this what it means by appropriate variables? Or, like, do I need to store them as their own, like... Yeah, you're... you're so, maybe this is a good time to look at the next step. So, because what you're going to use something for helps to shape yes. What, yes. what types and everything you want it to be in. Yes. Okay. Because... So... The thing, all right, right. So if I look at the next step, we're doing bond lengths, right? So yeah. we're using, we're calculating the interatomic distance using this expression, which is here. <laughs> Un, in, unreadable. Which is, yeah, which is which is uh, entirely just unintelligible. Um, where X, Y, and Z are the Cartesian coordinates. Okay, so from what I'm gathering here, I need to store these values as X, Y, or Z coordinates. So like they're already separated here, but I feel like I need to further separate them and say that this particular section are X coordinates. This particular section is Y coordinates. And then finally we have Z coordinates. Yeah. Um, and something else I you may want to do. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know what type they are right now? I'm assuming they're, they're strings right now. Right. So you yeah. want to actually do math on them. You can't usually right, do we, math yeah. on strings. So you're also going to want to do some kind of conversion there. Where we want to convert the string to a float or yep. something like that. Yep. Okay. Um, is there a way that I can do that like on this line where I just store them as a... Well, I can't because the first one is uh, is actually an integer, right? So I can't... We can do that. We can do that when I take them and store them in the next one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually, okay. you could... But it would be pretty intense, so yeah, better not to. All right. That's why I was grinning. Yeah. So now that I have these lines, these individual lines, yeah. Um, if I wanted to store them as their own vec, would I want to store them as their own vector? Sure. Okay. So I just, I think naively, I would, I would want to like just copy this line. Could I do like let line and then one for the X coordinates? Would I be able to do that and then store it in its own vector? Do you want me to just like type out yeah, what I'm you saying? Type what you're saying and then we'll, we'll see how it looks. Okay. So it doesn't what I'm sound saying good, is, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, that's, yeah, <laughs> I, ex I expected as much. Okay. I'm seeing now that I probably can't do that with all these angry squiggles. Yeah. Um, okay. Something's, it's just, a, it's so rather up steady let's spaghetti. Just, okay. Let's just talk a little bit about this before you get too far along. So you can put that back, but do you, so when you use let, that is creating a new variable. Oh, I don't want to create a new variable. Right. It looks like you're trying to access a variable. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you don't need the let for that. And then... I will have to actually, I can actually tell you a new bit of syntax for this. Um, if you want to append something to a vector, you have to use vector.push. Okay. So you'll need that. You're not quite ready for that, but I, you did mention putting things in vectors. So you're going to need vec push. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, all right, all right, all right. So this, is this line so far at least bare bones? I need to edit it, right? But do I need to delete this whole line and start fresh that I've just added? Yeah, I, I would probably delete that line. But but what were you okay. going for with that line? 
Well, okay, so I've already done all this work, right, where I have let line equal some vector. Yeah. I want I want to access a specific, I guess, index right. of the vector and store that in its own vector. Okay, well, we've got a line kind of like that already. The next line. Yeah, here, okay. Okay, so okay. what I need to do, what I do, like, vec dot push? Well... No, Sorry, that I might have been misleading. Yeah. So when I said vec.push, that vec or push is a method on vectors, but you need okay. a you need an existing vector to call it on. So what vector do you want to push these into? I guess I don't have one yet. That's right. So I need to initialize a vector. Yes. Okay. What I need to do that inside or outside of this for loop? Well, do you assume... want to Yeah, do you want to reinitialize it on every line or do you want it to persist across all of the lines? I don't, I don't know what those words mean. Well, do you want to use, if you want to use it for a single line and then have it be destroyed, do it inside the loop. No, I want to, I know I want to keep adding it to a vector. Right. Like I don't want to just like, okay. So then it should be outside the loop. Okay. So then how do I, all right. So I guess I need to look up how do I, or how do I initialize a vector? Do, should I look in the documentation I think, for that? Or? I think we can just do it from here maybe. Because it looks okay. it looks exactly like your string new line, except instead of string you say vec. <laughs> oh my god. Okay, so let mute. Yep. Uh, I don't know. I'll just call it x. Sure. Okay. Perfect. Oh no, wait, I didn't need to do that. I do equals. Yep. Vec new. Beautiful. Uh. <laughs> the <Yeah>. stupid inlay hands. <laughs> okay. Okay, so there's that. And I guess I should do the same thing for Y and Z, right? Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. you may need the atomic charge at some point. Okay. Well, I can I can do that too. You can do it, yeah. <laughs> uh, charge. Yeah, the tragedy here is that you usually use the symbol Z for atomic charge, you know? <laughs> yeah you can't use z for because you've already got z yep let me charge Ooh, it's charged something already that's okay it's mad because it doesn't know the type of the vector but as soon as you push things into it it will be able to oh. infer the type okay so that's actually just a temporary squiggle okay <clears throat> okay so now i would think this is kind of where i can start <laughs> doing something like that yeah so i want to push this onto a vector yep so what i need to do something to the effect of like what i need do i need to say like i don't know what the syntax is here but yeah this is a vector yeah it's it's vec dot push so name of vec dot push oh 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 okay yeah x X dot push and then I would say line one. Yep. Oh man. And look, yeah, awesome. you can see your inlay hints. See now it knows the type of X. That's cool. Kind of okay. neat, right? Yeah. Well I guess I need to do this. I need to say C char charge. I can make that zero. And then Oh, you can't do that to me. All right, so this is Y, and then Z, and I can do. Nice. Beautiful. All right, perfect. And you can delete that line if you want. Yeah. Nice. Okay, so now I have each of those things. Yep. Okay. Give it a run. What's well, not gonna do anything? What do you mean? Well, I'm not. Well, never mind. Oh, it'll do something. Oh God. Uh oh. The 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 len is one, but the index is one. Do you okay. remember in your geom file if some one of the lines was different from the others? Oh, it sure was, wasn't it? Yeah. Oh man. So this is a this is a great segue into conditionals. Cause oh, you God. want to do something 
if something is the case and not do something otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If the length of the line is greater than one. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. Oh, wait, really? And that's basically what you're right. Yeah. Okay. So if. if... <laughs> and the way you say it, though, is actually line dot length. Because, okay. or and it's L-E-N, not, you don't have to write all of length. Because len is a method on vex. Okay, so I don't need to have, do or I need to do, have Yeah, it's use? a method, so you do have to call it. Yep. Line okay. dot len. If the line, if the line, okay, is, well, I mean, greater than one. Sure. Do something. How do I indicate that I wanted to? Oh, uh, do I need to have this? Yep. Yeah, the answer okay. is usually curly braces. At least, okay. Uh, pretty much everything we've done so far. All right. Well, I want it. I want that to be the thing, but I want to take this out of it, right? No. The first, the first line of this file is the number of atoms. Oh, 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 oh. oh. I see. So actually, yeah, if there's only one element, you, you want to skip it. Okay. So what do I, do I need? Okay, we're cool then, right? We're all right. That's perfect. Yeah, beautiful. That yeah. should run successfully. And now, now you should be right that it won't do anything. But you can give it a run and make sure. All right. Hey, yo. Great. That's so cool. One other thing you might want to take care of while you're here is if you look at your inlay hints, you'll see that these yeah. are all actually vex of strings still. Oh, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Is so, there a way that I can, like, like not, I don't know. <coughs> I guess I need to do the the convert, like, how to convert a string into a, into a float. Yeah. I guess I need to look that up in the documentation. I guess so. I'm trying. I actually don't know if the documentation will be helpful, but let's find out. Let's see. I won't let you flounder for too long. <laughs> okay, sounds good to me. I think this is one of the things that's a little bit difficult about the documentation. Yeah, that's not looking too good. Maybe I need to do like convert. Rates for conversion between types. Maybe. So I guess I'll, I'll just tell you what to search. Try parse. God. Okay, parse. So even knowing what to search, I'm not sure it's going to help. But but yeah, go go up to the top one. Okay, parses this string into another type. It can cause problems with type errors. That's one of the few times you'll see the syntax affectionately known as the turbo fish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we could have actually Parse. used the turbo fish on the uh, on the collect, but I was trying to save you from the turbo fish. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let for. But you might four. be old enough for turbo fish now. Using the turbo fish instead of annotating for, okay. I don't think this is making sense to me. Okay, so that that one that you just read, using the turbo fish instead of for, yeah. or actually the one below that, this one, or no, 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 sorry, yeah, the turbo fish one. That's the one you want, basically. So, you have some string, in this case four, right? Yeah. You call dot parse on it. Yeah. And you use the turbo fish to specify what type you want to parse into. Okay. And then we'll actually use the dot unwrap from above. That way we don't have to deal with the match or question mark or anything. Okay. So unwrap is a way to just say, I don't care about your stupid result. Just give me the okay value or crash the program. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
So is this so like I'm do I need to do this on this line right yes. here? Yes, you actually need to do okay. this on each of the lines. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So I would need to do like what is it? Dot parse. Yeah. And colon then... colon. Oh, yeah. Let we got to You got a turbo fish. It's real. Turbo fish is really weird looking. Colon colon, and then you do the angle brackets because that's how you specify a generic type parameter. Okay. So you just put a type in here. Okay um what what's the standard float type well do you want the charge to be a float or a uh an integer no the, no no it'd be an integer so what i usually use for integers is called u size so this is an unsigned integer which basically means a positive integer yeah okay and the size part refers to like the size of your cpu architecture okay so if you have like a 64-bit processor then u size should be a 64-bit unsigned integer. Okay. So it's just a yeah, it's a convenient thing to use. So u size. Okay, perfect. And now we need to do the dot unwrap. Now you need to actually call parse. So now you put the parens, and then you unwrap. Oh my lord. Yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> so the other option like you saw in the documentation is that you could actually annotate the type of charge itself so if you'd rather write let charge colon vec u size that would also solve this problem but it's just up to you turbo fish or annotate your vector either way okay so the next ones are going to be uh floats though yes and the, so, the floating type you should use rust actually has multiple floating types you should use f64 okay so i would need to do like uh it's dot parse yep. right dot parse and then this little guy f64 yep is is there like a is there an f size somewhere or uh no so again the, yeah the u is for unsigned mm-hmm and there's also an I size for um, sign. Okay, cool. Yeah, but the all the floating point types start with F. I think it's only F32 and F64. But you know, for high precision stuff like this, we definitely want 64 bits. Sure, all right, perfect. Okay, that's good. So you have all these unwraps. So the fact that it, it finished actually means that all the parses work. Even though you're not printing your XYZ or anything, you, you can be confident that, they, that it worked. All right, Mr. Crash. Now, your inlay hints are actually wrong. I don't, that's not a good sign. <laughs> because it should know that, like, charge should say that it's a VEC U size, and the other two should say VEC F64. But <laughs> for some reason, it didn't update. Oh, geez. Okay. Okay. Well, now I have all of my, now I have all my vectors. True. Beautiful. Perfect. Um, uh, ba, 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 ba. Yeah, I mean, you can debug them if you want to see them, or you can you can just move on. I guess you're you're probably ready to compute bond links now. I'm ready to compute bond links. That's so for sure. <laughs> I will say that I also need to go and mow my lawn. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is this is probably a pretty good stopping point if you want. Why don't you why don't you debug all your new vectors? Just take a look at them and then uh okay. Then we can skedaddle if you want. Okay. Let me do that then. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and I'll go ahead and debug all of my vectors. Uh, I guess down here is as good as good a place as any, right? To yeah, do a little sure. bit of some DBG for like sure. this and then do I need to do like the ampersand charge or do I just need to type charge? No, you can just type it. And you can actually put them all in here separated by commas. Oh, nice. Or you can have separate X. ones, whatever you want. No, I don't want separate ones. Charge X, Y. The Fumter, ah! the Fumter. I forget that it exists. <laughs> It'll fix all of that. Yeah, yeah. There you That's go. what they keep telling me. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, whatever. <gasps> Beautiful. Dude, look at that money. Yep. X, y, That's, free. That's free money. And it even looks right. <laughs> okay. 
All right, why don't you commit that and then uh, go mow your lawn? <laughs> yeah, I'll do that. I'll go. I'll go mow my lawn. Okay, so it's Control X G. I need to stage that stuff, and then I need to do C C to commit. Uh, let's see. Uh, I will say that I split the lines of file into appropriate vectors. Nice. And then now I can do C. Perfect. Perfect. All How right. How do you feel? I feel pretty good. That was fun. Okay, good. Yeah, I thought that was pretty good. Yeah, I think that's it. I, yeah, I think this has been a good experience so far. Awesome. Well, sounds playing good. Around. Let me know uh, when you want to do it again. Okay, it sounds good. Well, I guess uh, I'll just wrap up wrap up the video. I know we only got through half of like one project. Probably not even half. I bet you there's a lot more left to go. Oh, yeah. There, this project's pretty long, but a lot of yeah, it's pretty similar. Oh, wow. And we, I think we covered we a lot order. of important stuff, though. I mean, we, we had to, like, get into Rust. <laughs> we had to talk about enums, results, yeah. options. We had to talk about, you know, match. Uh, and we covered, like, all the important control flow. We covered if. We talked about for loops. We talked about iterators. We talked about strings, yeah. floats. Yeah, yeah. We covered a lot of important stuff. Yep. So, yeah. I thought it was a, I think it was a good video, as long as, as long as you feel good about it. No, I feel good about it. I think it's I think it's good. Oh, and we I mean, covered a horrific bug in Eaglet. <laughs> yeah. This is kind of scary. I think if you revert the buffer it should fix it, but who knows? Revert booth. Yeah. Alright, well. I guess uh I guess uh, I guess I guess that's it. Alright. Thanks everybody for watching and we'll see you next time. We'll see you next time. Bye bye. Adios.